people in the happiest places in the world. This is a research by uh, Dan Butner that did the work on blue zones of happiness. Mm -hmm. And commonly people in those areas have someone to love. And that it doesn't have to be a uh, romantic in the sense of it, it could be someone to love a child, someone to love a parent, someone to love a, a friend, but like this real deep, intimate connection, I think is the, the important part. Hello and welcome to Self Talk. I'm Rachel Astarte. My guest today is Anthony Paponi. He is a neuroscience nerd, positive psychology practitioner, and a leadership lover. He's a professional speaker, a jokester from birth, close to my heart, and specializes in putting joy in our workplaces and in our communities through workshops and presentations that leave his audiences laughing and buzzing. So hopefully that will happen a little bit, at least today during our, our talk. Anthony, welcome to Self Talk. All right, so thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so it would be wonderful if you could give us an idea of your background. How did you get into the field that you're in? What was your calling? Yeah, you know, there's how much time do we have, Rachel? That could take four to five. <laughs> yeah, All I would right. say, you know, if you look at sometimes, and I think of my path and as as almost in a sense like nonlinear, and sometimes you know it's like a straight line early squiggly straight line, you know, and whatever, um, you know, I have a degree in science and degree in biology. So I love all things science. And I also have a real passion for professional speaking. And, uh, and I've always had that. It started back when I was uh, working with sea turtles and somebody would be like, Hey, somebody go tell these people about sea turtles. I'd be like, I want to do that. <laughs> and other nice. things, like get in front of a crowd. And, you know, so a big part of my work is professional speaking and conferences and then working in workplaces and then you know, working in small groups. Mm -hmm. So, I, but I have a long history in nonprofits and so I'm very service focused. And, you know, after a while, standing on a stage is fun and entertaining and comedy, but I wanted to keep like diving down into how serving more people, you know, and, and getting them to be like the version of themselves that they, that they see and taste. Like a lot of people get to experience that in brief moments. And how do we bring that out more in them? Mm -hmm. And so I continue to just dialing in on you know, what, what that human condition is or what the challenge is for, you know, people and then helping them along that path. Beautiful. And um, so let's talk a little bit about that. How, what, what do you bring in your, in your public speaking, in your workshops? Um, what's your focus in, in, in working with people and, and helping bring out that, um, uh, that core sense of self in them because everyone's different. Right. So it's hard to sort of say, here's how the, here's the one blanket way to do it. Yeah. How do you negotiate that? Yeah, it's really hard. And, and you know, you, you'll say this, I'm sure with your clients too, is like, you know, you meet with someone and in your case, if you have an ongoing relationship with a therapist, that's fantastic. Our coach, that's great. That's where you can start getting into the real like nuts and bolts of who you are and the real uniqueness of you. There's tools and techniques and, and, and strategies and exercises and assessments that, that can help start like at least giving some common language to that. Mm -hmm. But I would say, you know, a big part of what has to happen is then people have to do something about it, right? right. They have to do the behavior change and notice the patterns and the, to the tendencies and, and do the interrupts to, to change to the new behavior. And, um, you know, so a, a lot of the stuff, if it's in a, you know, in a workplace, you know, if it's like, you know, then it's just, it's mostly fun with some insights, you know, to give people some entertainment that they can just grasp on one thing and run with that. That's great. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, in a workshop setting, so much of it is about trust in the human brain and just what that, and when we don't trust our colleagues and we don't trust our supervisors, we don't trust our workplace, whatever that is, or even if we don't trust our family unit or our community, then we just, you know, we start. We, we get very self-centered, self-focused where, where our fight or flight gets turned on. Mm -hmm. And I think the idea is to, to a, um, you know, point out the importance of trust and then also what the common factors are of trust in a workplace and then, and then start building that, you know, and, and for all of these things, I don't think it's like, it, it's just like 10%, 10%, 10% more. And so if people can have an insight in the, you know, workshops, I do a lot of Your greatness comes with blind spots. 
you know, and how do we, how do we honor both of those pieces? And I don't think we work, I don't work a ton on, you know, what are you really weak at? Let's make that as strong as everything else. You know, right, no, right. At this age in life, you know, I have a lot of tendencies and a lot of really good things about me. How do I elevate those without undermining myself completely? Yeah. Yeah. And you spoke a little bit about making that shift from a particular way of being or behaving mm-hmm. to one that is more functional. And, um, and so that brings in neuroplasticity and, and I wonder since you're a neuroscience nerd and I love that myself, if you could talk a little bit about how does that work? I mean, you don't have to get too technical, but a lot of people, maybe if I preface it this way, a lot of people see where they want to be and then see where they are. And it's very hard to make that leap in their mind. And what can you say to help them through that? Well, you know, the, the phrase that I love that, you know, we don't need to get into to brain um, anatomy, but, you know, neurons that fire together, wire together, mm. you know, and so you can associate the new behavior that you want with something positive, you know, and that we know, you know, roughly 21 days to get this new behavior and, you know, just realizing that it's, it's, it's not going to come like, there's not going to be these big aha moments during this process of transition. You know, it's just going to be, Oh, that's not what I want to do. Don't do that. Do this instead. And then being like, good, I did it. You know, like just that one little thing of just like one little thing. So it's repetition. And I think, you know, applying positive emotions to that as well. And, you know, and just like these habit breaks that we're trying to do, like the the simplest version that I share a lot on stage is, is working with people that, you know, like for me is sharing a story about my phone, you know, like I am working on breaking my phone addiction every day. So I can be more present with the people in front of me and like really pay attention to life. And, and so just, you know, that habit formation of like, no, I don't need to look at the little red icon on this thing and I can get back to what I'm doing. Right. Good job. Good job, you know? And, you know, the other part of that too, for me is like literally sometimes of like throwing the phone across the room, Mm -hmm. say, something soft and just being like, if it's over there, I have to go get it to pay attention to the thing it's doing. And so, mm-hmm. you know, part of, um, I think what's helpful for folks is just to get the, the, the bad stimulus out of the way. So it's not a stimulus anymore, you know, just yeah. like if you're diet, don't put the potato chips in the front of the, <laughs> you're, you're going to be like, oh, I'll just have a few, you know? Right. Pretty simple. Right. And yeah. I like what you said about the positive reinforcement that you give yourself and that yeah. every step you're taking is actually part of that that neuron firing that helps to change our, our behavior and, and yep. the pattern of, of behavior. Beautiful. Okay. Um, can you talk, I, obviously I went to your website and checked it out. You have something called focus on the 40. What is that approach? Can you explain that? Yeah, it's, um, it's from research and it popped up in the book of the how of happiness by uh, Sonia Lubomirsky. Uh, she's a doctor working in positive psychology. A really solid book. And one of the things that the, it, there's, you know, the, all of this research now in positive psychology, and uh, it's really working towards understanding, like, how do we get towards flourishing? You know, that's the best of what we can be. And one of the, one of the research, one of the elements that came out from the research was the sort of breakdown of like what we think we know about our happiness, like our individual happiness and where that comes from and how much we control about it. Mm-hmm. So they were out that about 50% of our happiness is a genetic determination coming from our parents. It's mm-hmm. just a starting point. We can alter that permanently. We can alter that starting point or we can alter that permanently and shift it up over time. And then we can also alter it daily in mo- moment to moment by just understanding like what triggers our own happiness. Mm-hmm. You know, watch this not about not chasing elation all the time because that's a dangerous treadmill, right? We can't, we're not meant to be happy all the time. We're not meant right. to be elated all the time. Right. And the, you know, so the, the research said 50% is genetic and then only about 10% is life circumstance. So when they looked at all of the different characteristics, they have huge databases on human happiness uh, across the world. And when they looked at people's age, their sex, their sexual orientation, their religion, their marital status, their financial status, uh, location in the world, size of their community, whatever those things were, Mm -hmm. any of those variables uh, only accounted for about 10% in the variation of the happiness of people. Wow. So you can put some things in there, right? But you shouldn't really put all of your energy there. So 50% is your genetics. Good luck shifting those. We're not quite there yet. With 
10% is maybe putting your energy towards the smallest piece of the pie. So the other 40 is where you should focus. And that's mm-hmm. focus on 40. And that's really just about intentional actions. And so just understanding like, well, let's dive into what really makes us happy and what some of those things are. And, and they're not all flashy. It's, mm-hmm. You know, do things in the world for happiness, set goals and go after them, have really great relationships. And you'll be happy as the happiest people. And, uh, and so that's really what I try to do is just refocus people around that 40 towards that 40. And, you know, if people focus on, you know, the 10%, there's elements in the 10%. If you can go deeper with that, mm-hmm. about what you're trying to do like why you want the next job. Well, if I have the next job, then I can afford to put my kids in college and that's important. And the next job, you know, fine. Like if there's a deeper why to that, that can be great. So that's where. Okay. Beautiful. I love that Thanks. too. And, and it's interesting to think about how much of our, our genetics plays a part um, because a lot of people like, okay, I can't, I can't change that, but there is so much that we can change. And I think that that's, um, that's very hopeful. Um, and do you find that you, you said, like, for example, setting goals and achieving them, that's causing uh, the happiness to, to occur or creating relationships um, or having healthy relationships. Does that necessarily mean uh romantic relationships or does it mean relationships with all people or things or beings or self? What do you think? Well, I would say yes to both. I mean, ideally, right. Um, you know, when we look at relationships, it's been described as having three components to it of like what, what kind of support you get out of relationships. So it's emotional support. So I'm having a really hard day with something and I can share it with someone and I can be vulnerable and I can not be judged. It could be informational support of just like, you know, I don't know how to make my Wi-Fi router work, you know, or it can be tangible support. Like I have to go to the doctor and I have a sprained ankle. Can you drive me there? Okay. But that's important. A lot of the research does say that. So those, are, those relationships are important. And I'll stay there for just a second to say, and if you're an introvert, it doesn't mean having a hundred best friends. Okay. If you're, it might, you know, but, um, but it's like that. The magic number is like somewhere around three people that you can be like vulnerable with and share things with and be transparent with and know that you're not going to get judged on it and that you can just like process that with other people. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, then the second part of that is certainly romantic relationships. There is some uh, correlation between uh, people in the happiest places in the world. This is a research by uh, Dan Buettner that did the Welcome Blue Zones of Happiness. Mm -hmm. And commonly people in those areas have someone to love and that it doesn't have to be a uh, romantic in the sense of it, it could be someone to love a child, someone to love a parent, someone to love a, a friend, but like this real deep intimate connection, I think is the, the important part. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. Cause I know I have a lot of introverts listening going, Oh no, <laughs> I, I'm screwed. Um, <laughs> all right, good. And I also kind of identify as an introvert, but I, I, as you explain it, it makes a lot more sense that, you know, what we're looking for is having those parts of the brain um, and, and the rest of our body as well um, fired up with that feeling of support and feeling that, if we need help, there is someone we can go to. If we need to talk, there's someone we can talk to. Um, also, uh, you have keynote speeches that you do. And one of the topics is the hard parts of happiness. And I wonder if you might speak about that since we are on the subject of happiness. Sure. Yeah, I, I think, you know, the hard parts speaks to what you had uh, brought up before about or what we had spoken about before of like this chasing, a you know, chasing elation, mm. you know, we should experience those moments. Absolutely. Our brains are not wired to feel that way. It's, it's, we have neurochemicals that give us those feelings and they metabolize in our body like anything else. And they go, the, those feelings go away because of the, the lack of that chemical being present anymore because it's now gone. And, you know, the research in positive psychology really, you know, says really there's five parts to to happiness and you can put them in clusters. One is positive emotions. So understanding how those are triggered, how to extend those more in your life, how to feel them more often in your life and how, how to do it more frequently and more intensely feel the positive stuff, right? Knowing that they're going to go whoop and then back down, you know, you're coming back down. Fine. Um, Engagement in life. So this is the experience of flow that Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, uh, the now past researcher came out with, that just understands these moments of like, 
when we go deep on something and we get lost in something and we're challenging ourselves to do something, it could be playing a guitar, it could be building a spreadsheet, it could be navigating a complex situation that we don't necessarily feel happy in the time. But when we look back on that, we're like, whoa, like time slowed down there. I was really focused. I did something really hard. And look at me, I did that, you know? Mm-hmm. And so like, happiness in retrospect, you know, and looking mm-hmm. back, right. that can be the part of happiness. Uh, relationships can be really hard, you know, and um, and relationships are, you know, the, the hardest part of life on this planet is the fact that we have to share it with other people. <laughs> yeah. yeah, amen to that. <laughs> you know, and if you can master relationships, um, I think it, you know, it can be really hard, but there's a lot of real value in that, especially long-standing relationships, mm-hmm. like family, you know, and um, relation uh, partners. And then, you know, when we talk about the the final two parts of of happiness it's like meaning you know and meaning is one of them it's a sense of belonging sense of contribution a unique contribution to the world service to other people can can be really hard right um, and really putting other people first is maybe not how we're always wired right, right. because we have brains want us to worry about us because we're amazing mm-hmm. and and then achievement and mastery is that last part you know and so we should always be thinking about growing and growing and growing and moving forward is a, a, you know, that road to mastery can be full of potholes and it doesn't always feel comfortable because what's comfortable is what we do very easily right now. Right. As we of our current selves into like what that new self is, as we taste that and touch it, mm-hmm. we don't always. And, um, and so that's, those elements are really where the hard parts really kind of lie. And, it doesn't always feel good at the time, right? It doesn't always feel natural and easy, but then when you do those things, it can, it can really bring you happiness. Yeah. Uh, sometimes I liken it to going to the gym and you're exercising really hard because you want to earn, you know, you want to get your muscles up and then the next day you're in immense pain, you know, and you're like, well, that was stupid. I'll never do that again, but that's exactly what you need to do to tear the muscles again and, you know, and have them get stronger. And so we have to go through that discomfort uh, sometimes of changing in order to to achieve that level of happiness. Now, uh, happiness is such a huge subject, but I want to I want to touch on one more element of it um, because sometimes with my students we talk about this. Sometimes with my my patients, what would you say is the difference between happiness and contentment? Yeah. And, you know, and even folks that work in the, the field of happiness and research don't even use that term very much. <laughs> they use the term subjective well-being or life satisfaction. Okay. Uh, and so for me, I, you know, I would say contentment is like that, you know, what we talked about before, the little yo-yo, like the high moments, where do you come back to? Mm-hmm. And then the little um, when you come back up, where do you come back to? Mm-hmm. And in that moment, can you be content? You know, in that can you look around you and be like, the life I have is pretty close to the life I want, you know, and there's probably always going to be a delta there between where you are and where you'd like to be, because our, we are wired to kind of like continue, you know, our brains, right. our brains are amazingly complex and also incredibly lazy. They like to just keep doing the same path over and over again, because right. well, keeping us alive and we've done, they've done so they, it has done well enough so far, you know, so there, I think we're always kind of like when we get to some point, you know, we tend to want to, our brains tend to want to get us to move on, you know, and to do that perceived as good for our survival. Perception is a big word in a lot, where a lot of the danger and chasing happiness comes from. Mm. Um, and then, you know, the, so the difference in, you know, subjective well being is, you know, maybe I'm bridging both of those in there of just like, you know, how much do you love the life that you have versus how much do you want more and different things? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I do also like what uh, Dan Buettner again uh, says about the happiest people on the planet is he has three P's on it. And if you know from my bio, I love alliteration. So yes. he says purpose, pride, and passion. So how passionate are about you about the life you live? And he, he, he speaks a lot to subjective well-being versus happiness as a definition as well. But how much passion do you have for the life you have? How much pride do you have in the life you live? Mm-hmm. And how you have in life you live mm-hmm. so okay. i think that that summates it pretty nicely i think for me yeah so um yeah i like that a lot actually um so the idea is not necessarily chasing the quick fix of happiness because happiness is an emotion and like any emotion it's transient 
Definitely. So, and, and that's okay. Right. So it's just part of what it means to be fully human is to have these, these ups and downs. So the contentedness, I, what I think I understand you to mean is that it's that sort of middle point. How content are you with where you are in your life right now and in the long run? Mm -hmm. No, I think your video froze there, but I, I assume you'll come back in a moment. Um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about um, chaos, if, if you um, are still able to hear me, uh, taming the constant of chaos. And I wonder if you could talk about that. Oh, dear, I think we did lose you. Are you there? There we go. I am so sorry about that. That's all right. Um, yeah. So, um, so leaping to the next subject a little bit. Um, one of the other keynotes you have is, is about chaos, the taming the constant of chaos. And I think that also speaks to the, the, to the way that our lives shift, the way that emotions are transient and, and that, um, you know, we, we are constantly in the middle of, change which can be chaotic so is that really what that that constant of chaos is about yeah i mean part of it is perception too like how you react in those situations you know and you know the real power in our brain is not back here this is the limbic system that's the old reptilian brain that's the fight or flight that the self-focused part of brain part of the brain and then up here is the you know the cortex where all the good stuff happens and this is the executive function, the computer, all the good things happen up here, but you can only put power on for one part of the brain at the time, right. at any time. And, um, you know, and so if you're living back here in, and chaos is causing stress and you perceive stress as negative, then stress is going to be negative and stress is going to turn you into, you know, fear-based versus right. Right. up here where you can be processing. And um, so part of it is perception. And then part of it is this sort of like the magic between stimulus happens negative thing happens and then the, the response that you choose and sometimes the, the response you choose can be the default and it can be in a micro moment but choose wisely because that the, it's a small space in time but there's real magic in that space of mm -hmm. like choosing to be best mm -hmm. self where is your best self there and so part of that i think is like you know all this negative self-talk that we have we all have it right and, right. and it's like how high is the volume of that self-talk mm -hmm. and how over time can you just like, I'm going to click the volume down slowly over time. And as you're doing that, you're calming this function and you're, you know, extending more access to this function. And that's probably somebody that's a brain uh, scientist will say, that's not exactly how it works. But, you know, the point is for people around us to understand mm -hmm. science. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so I think that's a big part of it. And, and if we can just become, you know, more often honoring like the, you know, knowing what the best choice is the, in those situations and being able to hit on that more often, it's not going to happen every time. And then that's okay. You know, and then you just can't be like, well, I should have, I should have, I should have. Right. right. That's a huge trap. Don't, Absolutely. don't play goods, you know, and just honor what happened and be comfortable enough to say, Hey, that wasn't the best version of me. That's not how I want to do things. I reflected on it. Here's what I wish I would have said done in that moment, you know, and I think that's the big part of going back and like, you know, that vulnerability piece of being like, I'm not perfect. And it's, and you're not perfect either. And we're all working this out together. And mm -hmm. I just want to be the best I can as much as possible. Yep. As Ram Das says, we're all just walking each other home. So yeah, right. yeah, exactly. All right. Beautiful. So how can people find you, Anthony? Uh, website's the easiest place, I guess, to start. It's anthonypoponi.com. That's P-O-P-O-N-I dot C-O-M. Okay, beautiful. And um, I think you also have a, a Twitter and Facebook. I'm going to have all the all of the links in the show notes so people can find you. And I just want to thank you for being on Self Talk today. Yeah, thank you, Rachel. Great questions. It was a really excellent dialogue. My pleasure.